Welcome to our latest webinar for corporates. In this series, we'll be examining recent events and looking ahead at what might be in store for financial markets and the economy. Welcome to the April edition of the uh, monthly webinar. Uh, we've done uh, three of these thus far, and this one will cover um, what's gone before, particularly the end of the quarter, which I think is very important in terms of the technical uh, viewpoint and standpoint. And uh, from a, a macro piece, we've had a further update in terms of forecasts for the macro economy for the remainder of 2023 and 2024, which we'll be discussing in due course. But let's get on with it because um, we've got a relatively short period of time in order to present these slides and a lot to get through. So just looking very quickly at the content slide, uh, I'm going to start on one of my old favorites, which is money supply, um, because I think the recent trends are, are interesting and also somewhat concerning. Um, and then we're going to look at what's been happening in the sort of financial markets, the stress that we've been seeing, and and compare and contrast that with the, the most uh, recent forecast from the IMF. Then we'll look at interest rates and, and what we think is going to happen in May um, before turning our attention to the retail sector, which I've looked at uh, on a few occasions in 2022, um, just as a, a barometer of what's going on from consumers before we turn our attention to FX markets forecast. And of course, the disclaimer at the end. So let's uh, let's dig into the detail and look at the first slide about money supply. And I, I think this is worthwhile focusing on for a, a short while, at least, in terms of what are we what are we really seeing here? Now, these are not the same measures of money supply. You've got USM2, Euroland M3, and, and UK M4, but they're all heading in the same direction, which is downwards. And I think it's worthwhile noting that in terms of uh, money supply activity in the US, this is some of the worst numbers that we've seen in more than two decades. So definitely worthwhile focusing there because money supply is not just about the, the volume of money in the markets. It's also about the velocity of money in the markets. And if you've got a, a perfect storm, which is what we seem to have in the US at the moment, that can have negative consequences for both activity and inflation. So we'll keep a very close eye on that. And because we didn't see uh, this level of, of, of reduction in money supply, even when we saw the deflationary conditions post the financial crisis of 2008. Similarly, for Euroland, we're, we're getting to levels of um, money supply growth that we haven't seen in uh, around about eight or nine years. And for the UK, uh, money supply growth is now well below where we would expect it to be if we were trying to, on a, a medium-term basis, meet the inflation target of 2% and, uh, and also meet economic activity targets of growth of around about 2%. So these money supply figures are inconsistent um, with any of the major economies uh, meeting their targets for both growth and inflation. So there could be worse to come in terms of economic activity. There certainly could be quite a sizable reduction in inflationary pressures as we head through the remainder of 2023 and into 2024. So that ought to be where a lot of the focus of attention is now shifting as far as the central banks are concerned. And if not that, then if we move on to the next slide, then they ought to be concerned by what they're seeing with regard to financial market stress. Now, the table on the left, I know it's very small, apologies for that, but this is effectively CDS pricing, credit default swap pricing, for a lot of the major banks around the world. And what's happened here is because of the stress that we've seen in parts of the US and in parts of Europe, we've seen credit default swap pricing widen. So the risks of a default have increased, albeit that they're still relatively low. Now, bearing in mind that this is um, a very interesting uh, element to the, 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 the whole process as far as the credit markets are concerned, it, it is indicative, similar to what we've seen in other areas, like in terms of the reduction in uh, deposits in major banks being and those uh, monies being placed in money market funds, uh, of a potential credit squeeze, which could again undermine economic activity in the major economies and therefore have a negative effect on inflationary pressures as well. Now, that's interesting because if you look at what's then happening with regard to the IMF forecast in the right-hand table, they've actually been predominantly revised up for 2023, and it's a bit of a mixed bag for 2024. But global growth 
is revised down for both 2023 and 2024. You know, worthwhile noting that these April forecasts did see the largest upward revision for the UK. Remember that the January forecast saw the largest downward revision. So we have seen a reversal of some of that negativity as related to the UK. Now, that could be quite positive for sterling if that's what actually occurs. But I did say at the time when we saw those January forecasts, they looked a little bit weird. They looked odd. uh, And I suspected that the UK um, would be revised up. What surprises me is that you've also seen an upward revision to the US and Euroland growth for 2023, because there's no real signals from their economies that uh, that's justifiable, whereas there has been greater signals from the UK economy that the negativity that had been suggested around the UK was misplaced. So if we move on to the next slide and we look at interest rate expectations, I think given the the, the fact that you've seen this big fall in money supply activity and that you've seen um, quite a a sizable reduction in credit availability and some concerns over financial market stress, it would make sense if the next move for monetary policy for the likes of the US, the UK and Duraland is for them to do nothing, to pause, to wait in May and see what the data may bring. Now, for the US and UK, I think that's exactly what they're going to do. But for Euroland, I think there is a greater risk that they will raise interest rates by 25 basis points. In fact, the markets is now pricing in a 25 basis point rate rise from the European Central Bank in May. And that's the only major central bank that has that, uh, that move fully priced for. Bearing that in mind, I think we could see some quite sizable improvement in the euro's value versus the likes of um, the pound and the US dollar, because it's not a zero risk that the US and UK central banks uh, leave interest rates on hold. In fact, there's quite a uh, a sizable minority risk that both of those central banks do raise interest rates a further quarter point. Um, So bearing that in mind, I think that um, were we to see the European Central Bank be an outlier, uh, they raise rates whilst the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve leave interest rates on hold, um, then the markets would react positively towards the euro. Um, And and clearly that would undermine recent sterling strength against the euro, but you could also see um, the uh, the, the US dollar losing ground to the euro as well. So that that pause in central... uh, Bank activity is likely to happen for the US and the UK, less likely in Europe, where they do seem more alarmed by the uh, recent trends in inflation. And, consequent, and the recent uh, continued overshoot of inflation, particularly on core inflation rates. And, and therefore, I think they will continue with a modest additional tightening in May. But I don't think that's sensible for either the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England. And they will probably take the path of least resistance, which is to do nothing and wait and see. So if we move on to the next slide, and this is this is retail sales. What I wanted to highlight here is, uh, again, Noting the differences, because the US retail sales figures are values-based um, surveys, so that does take into account the rise of inflation, um, but Euroland and the UK are volumes-based, so it's, it discounts for the any inflationary impact on sales. And you can see that Euroland and the UK performing very poorly in terms of retail activity after that big recovery that we saw in, in sales volumes. Um, when both of those economies unlocked post-COVID. But you see this downward trend that the retail sector is enduring. And that's happening in spite of the fact that a lot of individuals are looking to try and tighten their belts. So perhaps not spending so much in discretionary services, and yet they're still not spending that money that they're saving into retail. So uh, one would anticipate that we would be seeing an improvement in the uh, the, the retail sales figures in volumes uh, on a volumes basis because of a reduction in spending on luxury items. But that's not what is happening here. So that tightening in credit conditions, which has still got some way to go because those interest rate hikes haven't been fully felt, uh, at least not for the, um, uh, uh, the house buyers uh, and homeowners part of society, which is relatively small in the UK. But think about higher rents. Uh, that leaseholders are facing as well. So uh, tenants are, are facing higher costs at the sa- in the same way that uh, uh, 
owners, homeowners are facing higher costs, but for different reason, reasons. And that, I think, is going to continue to put a squeeze on household disposable incomes, uh, not just for the UK, but also the US and Euroland into the end of this year, and probably to the start of 2024. Notable as well that even though we are seeing that squeeze on the housing market, we might already be seeing house prices starting to level off, uh, predominantly because of a lack of supply. So that's something that uh, that could be uh, a uh, a key driver of any improvement that we see in the second half of 2024, which is when uh, a likely upturn in most of these major economies is predicted to occur. So if we then turn our attention to the final slide, which is the FX market forecast, we've still got um, uh, the expectation of some constructive behavior behind both sterling dollar and euro dollar. Um, pretty much stable for sterling euro versus where it is now, maybe a cent higher or so, but I uh, st still think it runs into uh, a congestion zone in the high 114s. Um, risks are still asymmetric as far as sterling and the euro against the US dollar. Because if there is some sort of more sizable squeeze in credit conditions, I think that would actually favour the US dollar over those other major currencies. Not much else really to update you on with regards to these forecasts, although I think we are more negative around the South African rand than we were previously and I think there are still ongoing risks um, uh, around the Chinese renminbi, around their, their, their levels of economic activity as they um, um, continue to experience uh, problems over the unlocking of their economy. So dollar China, again, asymmetric risks to the top side, potentially back towards seven. And I think we're trading at around about sort of 688, 690 at the moment. So just watch out for all of that. I think if there is going to be some big moves, um, it might come because of a, a material change in macroeconomic risks um, and also a material change of focus away from interest rate differentials um, and on to some of those credit concerns that I've mentioned previously. So from, from one um, experienced hand to another, I'm going to pass over now to Piers Leslie. Um, there's the disclaimer as usual, not advice, just views and forecasts. But I'm going to hand over to Piers. He's got a lot to update you on after the end of the quarter. So Piers, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, so this is the way that the quarterly charts look, and we're going to have potential support and resistance levels to watch over the coming quarter, hopefully. So I'm going to start with the dollar index. And the dollar index quarterly chart, we can see that after last year's rally, we got that drop at the end of the year, that massive candle back down. Now, the first quarter of 2023 saw a much smaller move lower. So that dollar move coming back sort of stalled. And I expect that as we approach the 97 to 100 area, you're going to start to see some buying interest arrive for the dollar, some support arrive from the big picture. Now, if you look, you've got a lot in there. You've got the 38.2% of the whole move from the low to the high from 2008 up to 2023, uh, 22. So you've got that 38.2%. You've got the 20 moving average of the Bollinger Band. And so I think you're going to find support down there. So maybe a bit of dollar weakness, but I think soon you might start to see a bit of dollar strength return. Now, I think one thing to remember is that we are the year of the rabbit. Now, last year you had the year of the tiger for Chinese, which is a strong, dominant animal, and you should have a directional move. And we had a good directional move last year, a one-way move in sort of euro dollar, sterling dollar, everything very directional. The year of the rabbit is different because the rabbit is a creature that hops from place to place. So it's going to be much more of a jumpy year. So we're going to have to keep an eye on this. So I'm expecting dollar strength sort of arrive as we get down to that 97, 100 area. But keep an eye because things could change. So if we go to the next line, the next chart, next line, obsessed with lines, we can see euro dollar. So this is the euro dollar monthly chart. Now, I was going to do the quarterly chart, but I changed it to the monthly chart. And the reason for that, there's quite a bit happening on the monthly chart. So the quarterly chart, all we need to know about the quarterly chart is that if the dot, if you if we see euro dollar chain. 
uh, closed this quarter above 110.75, I think that is going to be a positive signal for euro dollar and take euro dollar higher up to one sort of 14, 115 area. But that's the quarterly chart. I can cover that all now because you're sitting at resistance. So the resistance on the quarterly chart is this sort of 110 area. And that's why I haven't bothered doing the quarterly chart, but gone to this monthly chart. But the monthly chart is interesting because if we look at the Bollinger Bands on here, you can see that for the last three months, price has been held by the Bollinger, the, the 20 moving average from the Bollinger Bands, the midline, so that pink line. But this month, price has opened above it. It's gone back down to test it and it's rallied off it. So there's a sign of for the euro dollar bulls to be happy about but they need to keep it above that area. So that's about 107.70. So while they can keep it above 107.70, 75, maybe you might see euro dollar go a little bit higher. Maybe it might go up towards that 112.75. We had those old trend lines. There's an orange trend line in there. You'll see this clearer when you get the charts, but there's an orange trend line in there that actually has capped the market for the last three months. It's just breaking above that. And that might make it go up towards that 112.75 area. But I think that 112.75 area will be tough resistance. So maybe a bit of a move up. Maybe that's that move down in the dollar index. But, you know, you might see a bit of a move up. But then it might come back down by the end of the quarter. So we need to watch that 112.75 area very closely. What about on the downside? We've talked about the upside. Now, on the downside is that 107.60.70 area first the 20 moving average from the Bollinger Bands. Now, if it gets below there, it should have stronger support around 106, figure 25, around that, the 106 area. And that's the 38.2% that you can see of those retracements. It's held it for the last three months. So it's an area where the market's going to be interested to buy if it gets down there, first of all. Now, if you get a close below that, then a monthly close below that, then that would sort of signal that maybe that move is over, this test higher is over, and we're going to see the dollar strengthen back down. But those are the levels I've watched on the quarterly charts, you know, especially if we've got to move up towards that 112, 112.75 area, and if it got down to the 106 area, that should be good support. But I'm going to keep you posted as the weeks go by and as the days go by on the daily and weekly charts, so keep an eye on those. Now, if we go to the next chart, Here, Sterling Index. So this is a, a chart that I think I've bored everyone to death about, but it's just worth highlighting because we're coming back to that area that I bore everyone to death about, which is the 38.2%. I've ringed it in that green line. So every time the Sterling Index has got to that area since Brexit, it's become a sell. But it's having quite a good run back up. Now, last year on the webinars, I pointed out that big spike on the bottom. If you go back three or four candles, you'll see the red body with that big spike. And I put, will this spike save sterling? So, yes, it seems to be moving sterling back up. But the real key for it here is going to be that 65, 65, 70. So we've got the 38.2%. And just above that, you've got the upper band from the Bollinger Bands. So that area, 65, 65, 70, that the price is just coming towards now is going to be where the battle takes place for Sterling. If it can get above there and close a quarter above there, then something is changing and people are happy. You know, the good news for Sterling, especially all of us who want to go on holiday abroad, is that blue dashed line going across the bottom. So that's slightly rising. So it shows that on a closed basis, that price has been trying to hold up. It's been bought on the dips and it's a slight uptrend. So you need that to hold. You need the top one to break. Now, if price was to come back down, if it was to fail, I would expect some selling to arrive when it got up to that 65, 65, 70 area. If price came off that and came right back down to that blue dashed line or the 23.6 uh, retracement, then I'll start to be concerned even before a break because why is it coming all the way back down? 
Now, the other thing that's happening, this is sort of doing a triangular constriction. Now, that triangular constriction, you need to break before it gets to the, the apex of it. So I think that if you're going to get a break, you're going to get a break in the next few quarters, one way or the other. But I think that's it on Sterling Index. Watch that 65, 65, 75 area. Should be resistance. Moves back down to sort of the 23.6 the sort of 62, 63 area should find support over this, this quarter. So if we move to the next slide, now I've done, for, for sterling dollar, I get asked more about sterling dollar than any other one. So I've done two charts. I've done the monthly and the, the quarterly chart. So this is the monthly chart that we had last November where we ringed all those black circles and we said, look, if price gets up here, it struggles. We re-highlighted it last month. And again, look, so you've had four successive months now where price has been held by that 2360. It hasn't managed to break above that 2360. So what did it do last month? We pointed out that the support for it was 116.47, 118.38. And it bounced really nicely off that 118 sort of 40, 118.38 area. It bounced nicely off there, up to the 2360. So the sterling dollar bulls are feeling quite bullish at the moment, and they're trying to push it up. But this is a big resistance area. This whole 12360, 12450, 12575, there's so many levels of resistance from different charts in here that different people are selling. So we have to see during this month, how can it hold up? Can it hold above that 2360? Because that would be quite a fee if it holds above 2360 has a clear close above that. And then that will put pressure on those other upsize targets. So we need to watch that as it, the month goes on. And no one knows the answer at this stage. So you just have to watch the weekly charts, the daily charts, see what happens. And I'd just say, if you just want to take down one level, I'd watch 125, 75, 80 this month. And while you're below that level, I think there's a risk you could see a bit of a pullback lower in sterling dollar. If you get above that level on a daily close, above 25.80 on a daily close, then you're probably going to start to see a move up towards that 127 area. And then we can cover it again next month. How does it look? But that's the level I'd look in between. But where would we look for if sterling dollar did come back down? Where should support be? And if this attack higher fails, then you could see a move back down towards. 12150, 122. Below that, you suddenly reopen up the 120 and the 118 and a half area. But watch that 12150, 122. That should be good support in, in the short term over this month. But the next chart is the quarterly chart. And we're supposed to be looking at quarterly charts. So let's get to that. So the quarterly chart, because the other one had so many retracements and lines, and I'm talking about different levels, I thought I'd try and keep. The quarterly chart simple. What interests me on the quarterly chart are the Bollinger Bands and the RSI at the bottom. So the RSI at the bottom isn't confirming that last move lower on the quarterly candles. And I think that's a bit interesting. So the, the move we got last time down, if you look there, didn't bring the, um, if we look back, this one, I think, is slightly more than 2016. If you look at that, you're slightly above it. So it's not 100% confirming at this stage. You also have just above here the 128.25 area, 128.20.25 area as the 20 period moving average from the Bollinger Bands. So we can see that from the last couple of months, the positive field has slightly gone down a bit. It's not making such gains up. So we know that 127 area is quite key on the last chart from the retracements. So maybe this 127, 128 could be quite a key area to watch. It should be where on an initial touch, the market does pull back. But what would be very significant if we suddenly see a clear quarterly close above that Bollinger Band, I feel. So that's it from the quarterly perspective, what to watch. Keep an eye on that 128, 2025 area, I feel. And then the final charts we're going to look at are euro sterling. 
So euro sterling, we're going to do first because I prefer these levels to the sterling euro. We'll have a quick look at sterling euro afterwards. So euro sterling, I think that last month I was saying we were approaching the 61.8%, 76.4% on the monthly and weekly charts. And I said resistance should arrive there, look for a pullback. And we've had that resistance arrive and we've had the pullback. And it was negative and it's come back down a bit. So while you remain euro sterling below 88, 30, 89 and a half, I think that will cap the market this quarter potentially. And there could be a test down towards the support in the 8620 area. And potentially the real big key support here is that 38.2, which is around 84 and a half. So that's where we could be heading down towards 86.20, maybe at a push 84.50. Where does that all change? Above 90. If you get a weekly close above 90 or a monthly close above 90, then something's changed. Someone said something, something's happened, and I think the market will react. And above 90, it will just go higher, and I'll take away that negative feel it has here. So if we just go to the sterling euro chart, the next chart, it's very easy, just in reverse. And I've sort of put the levels on there to watch. But again, it seems, you know, last month I said the 61.8, 76.4% retracement area, 111, 112 should provide support. And it has. We've rallied off there. So now we've got to see where the resistance will be. And I think you'll probably see resistance in the 116 area, maybe at a push 118.35. And where would I change that view? If we got down below 111, then something's changed. But those are the sort of levels I'd look for in sterling euro, euro sterling. Thanks very much for listening to the webinar. We hope you found it informative. The next in the series will be available shortly.